Welcome to the podcast series dedicated to living a revenue culture. The pandemic reminded us that business survival is about maximizing your profits. And the way you do that is by optimizing a purpose-driven revenue culture. And this podcast series is dedicated to tying those things together so we make the most money possible with the best people first culture. Today, our guest is Jim Downs. Welcome, Jim. I'm glad to have you with us. Good morning, Rick. I'm happy to be here and excited to share my story. Well, Jim and I have known each other for a long time, and Jim has had a marvelous career. He's been with uh, the big consulting firms. He's been a banker. He's been in private equity. He's been an entrepreneur. And now he's the CEO and the founder of um, the Blueprint CFO. And Jim, first share with me, where did you get the name Blueprint for an outsourced CR, a CFO organization? And you know, tell us a little bit about what, what you guys really do. Uh, well, Rick, when we started the firm uh, initially back in October of 2019, I was originally going to call the firm strategic CFO. And um, in doing our marketing um, planning, we were doing a lot of back and forth about what our value proposition was. And the word blueprint kept coming up because what we do with our clients is we help them create a blueprint for the future. So not like a typical accounting firm that's always focused on the past. Uh, you know, your, your accounting teams usually want waiting to tell you how much money you made in April or May when it's June. Uh, we're focused on the future. And so we help our clients create a blueprint for how they're going to grow their business and make more money. And then we hold them accountable to achieving that by doing monthly review meetings with them that look at their financial performance compared to the blueprint. Interesting. And, and, and Jim, you just said a really important thing. When you started this in 2019, and I know since you got started, you have grown really fast. And part of growing fast is bringing on new team members. And I know you've been really happy with the team members you brought on, and you brought on enough to keep expanding rapidly. Why the team members in this time where the world is trying to find enough employees, how come you're getting them? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I equate getting customers to getting employees. They're, if you're the leader of a company, it's your job to attract talent to work, <clears throat> work in your business. Um, so I've really focused on that with Blueprint and tried to get the best accountants that I felt were gonna do a great job for the client and keep the cost down and, and help them be more efficient in their accounting processes. But at the same time, we're focused also on getting the clients that can come in and, and help pay for those great accountants. Uh, you know, and it's been very um, helpful having gone through the revenue science program with you, the, the CRO thinking uh, certification, because it's all about how we attract talent and also attract customers. It's kind of the same thing. You have to, you know, you put forward your, your purpose, as you said a minute ago, the word purpose. You know, what is our purpose as an organization? And you get people to buy into that. And then it's easy to, as long as, as, long as they buy into it, then it's easy to attract clients and uh, top, top talent. Yeah. And, and I would guess that helping people look forward, is that as exciting to your staff as it is to your customers? Yes, because, you know, it, accounting is um, probably one of the more boring professions out there. <laughs> you know, when you compare accounting to what you do, uh, it's just, you know, not known as accountants are not known as exciting, <laughs> dynamic people, right? Uh, but I, we challenge our accountants to look at the data that is in the client's books of record and identify trends and, and uh, data points that we should be presenting to the client to help them grow their business and make more money, how, how to you know, reduce costs at the same time growing their revenues. And so that's a whole different ballgame than just being an accountant. Uh, so we're, we're teaching them pretty much how to be a consultant and to take that, take that data and come back with a story that we can tell the client that you know uh, tells a story of why they're doing well in certain parts of the business and not doing well in other parts of the business, <clears throat> which is quite typical. You know, no, no company is hitting on all cylinders. There's always things that you can do better, 
<clears throat> and the, the trick is finding the, tr the trends in the data that point out, you know, the things that are going in the wrong direction. Yeah, so that's our yeah. challenge. And when I, when a client, when my um, employees give me a, the monthly financial statements for our clients, and we're working with almost 20 companies now, <clears throat> I ask them, to, okay, I got, I see the financials. Tell me this, tell me what's going on. You know, and, and if they just say, well, that's just how the numbers came out. Uh, that's not good. You know, that's not good enough. They have to be able to tell the story of, well, yes, their, their sales were higher than we expected because our forecast was X and we got X plus Y. And that, you know, increased the rip margin because now our margins were 100 grand more than they what we thought they'd be. And that dropped down to the bottom line. So they made 100 grand more than what we thought they would. So that's the that's all the blueprint part. You know, it's what did we expect and what did we get? And, you know, we, we didn't get what we expect and what, what happened? What, what happened that caused the dump for the deficiency? And how how does how do your customers react to that? What's it sounds like that would be a different experience from my accountant than I'm used to. What do they respond to? Well, um, I had a client come in last week, and he's a new client, and his books are somewhat in a disarray. Um, so we're we're battling through that to get his books to a point where we can give him a, a financial that makes sense. And he said to me, Jim, it's not going fast enough. You know, I, I, I need this data to run my business. Now, this guy's run his business for 30 years with <laughs> having good data. So, but all of a sudden, because I, I sold him on the fact of how important it is that he have timely and accurate data every month to determine how to, how to make, how to run the business, what decisions you should make. He's totally on fire that he needs to get this data, you know, ASAP and I'm not doing a good job. So, so. <laughs> You can kind of get yourself in a tricky situation because, you know, what you're selling is, I think, what I, I had a call yesterday with a client, uh, same, same kind of thing. They're, they're a $10 million contractor, underground contractor. So they do foundations for buildings and that kind of thing. And they've been in business for a long time and I think they're profitable, but um, they said that they're, you know, they admitted on the phone that accounting is not their strong point. And they said they don't have uh, good records on each one of their projects of how much they make on each project. Well, how the heck do you how do you run a ten million dollar business without having good project accounting in the in the construction industry? That's that's totally crazy. But they're they're there. I mean, there's lots of companies like that. You know, and they that entrepreneurs. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but entrepreneurs tend to think of accounting as something they need to do to in order to file their tax return. And they don't see accounting as something that is, you know, something that could be a good tool to help them run their business better. And that's kind of what we're trying to teach them, that that's how you should think about accounting. It's by thinking about it as a future-based product versus a historical product that you can't do anything about the numbers that happened in the past. It, it, it really changes the dynamic of how they think about their accounting department. Yeah. And it's interesting as you're, you're telling that story, I'm thinking about times where the economy switches and all of a sudden the ability to get a bond or to you know get certified in order to even apply to do work is is a challenge and companies who you know are really uh not making a lot of profit but just living off increased cash flow from another deal all of a sudden they they aren't even in the game anymore that's correct. I mean, you mentioned my career, which has been um, multifaceted to, to, to describe it. I've kind of like found my niche now, I think, in terms of what I really love to do and, and the things that I'm doing with my clients. But at one point, I was a turnaround consultant. Yeah. And, um, you know, back in, back in the Great Recession, 2008 and 2009, I was a turnaround consultant and um, ultimately ended up at KPMG as head of restructuring for the West Coast. So working with companies that were in trouble. Well, the, the typical reason that companies were in trouble is because they didn't have good accounting and they weren't really paying attention to their numbers. And it was okay to do that when things were good. But when things got tough, if you, don't have, if you didn't have good accounting and you weren't able to react to see where you could cut your costs and you know, where, where the fat is in the organization through, your, through analysis of your data, you're kind of, you were kind of in a, a bad situation and, you know, you would have to hire a consultant to come in and try to, try to figure it out. But you, you sh companies that had their act together and had their th thumb and fingers on their numbers, you know, got through that time period by um, pivoting and identifying, you know, how they can continue making money, even if their sales went down. Now, 
I'm, I'm guessing from what we're talking about today and you and I have talked about before, what you're doing is not kind of acts of random good thinking. There's a systemic part to it. Is that a true statement? Can you share a little of that? It, well, it starts with the blueprint. And um, the systemic part is having a plan for your business. And I, I can tell you, um, I would say, and I have, there are some exceptions, but virtually every company that we get as a client, when we ask them what the plan is, they don't have one. You know, and and um, so basically they're coming into work every day and, and working their tail off, but they don't really, and, and hopefully making money, but they don't have a plan of, of where they're going with the business, what their goals are. You know, are they positioning to sell the business at some point or are they going to transition it to another generation? You know, all of that is just kind of murky. And I think the uh, systemic part is having, having a, a clear view of what you're trying to do in the next year, in the next three years, in the next five years. Uh, and if you go to our website, you'll see where our clients, you know, get, we gathered client testimonials for our website and we asked them just to say, you know, without prompting them what to say, um, what, how is help Blueprint helping them? And that's kind of a common theme is, you know, bringing them the data they need to execute their plan and, um, and, and achieve their goals with their business. So, because it's always interesting, you know, when you have a family home, owned business, which most of our clients are family owned, you know, we, we have one client that's a publicly traded company, but most, even a publicly traded company, there's, there's a um, connection between how the company does and how the individual does. And so if, if you're a business owner and you own a company and that, that could be your biggest asset in your portfolio of investments. And if you're not managing that, um, just like you would manage your, your stock portfolio, you know, expecting a certain return on investment and, you know, positioning it, it for sale at some point, even if you're not, don't want to sell, but somebody may come along and, and offer you a crazy number to sell your company. But if you don't have your accounting together, when you get into due diligence, you're going to, the people will take money off the table because they won't be able to understand how the company makes money. So yeah. the, the and, systemic part, I think, you know, doing, doing accounting every month is, is a systemic process. But the part about tying the accounting to your future um, plan is, is, I think, our unique uh, sauce that we, we do. And there's another part to it, too. We do a monthly financial package for the client, which not, doesn't give them just the basic balance sheet and income statement, which I always call a bunch of numbers. <laughs> so if you get a bunch of numbers, what do you do with it, right? But we, we take the numbers and put them into charts and graphs that show trends that, that are positive and negative in the data that they need to be paying attention to. So entrepreneurs love that because now they don't have to look at a financial statement and pretend they're an accountant and, and look at it and, and pretend they understand what the heck's going on there. Um, you know, I had one client recently call me up and said, hey, Jim, can, I, can we have a meeting at your office for an hour or so? And I said, sure, uh, JP, what do you want to talk about? He said, well, I want to, you to explain the difference between the balance sheet and the income statement. <laughs> now, this is a guy that's running a company that's, you know, doing 10 million in sales or whatever, and he's getting these monthly reports every month, but he has no idea what they are, what they mean, you know, and he's, but he feels like he's kind of, he must be dumb because he doesn't understand it. But guess what? He wasn't trained to be an accountant. Right. You know, he's a sales guy. He's great at sales. And so I'm his accountant, but I need to be able to figure out a way to give him the data in, in a format that he can understand and, and make decisions from, not a balance sheet. You know, pickup statement, which is what you get from your traditional accounting department. Well, Jim, it is, as I'm listening, a couple of things just really uh, <clears throat> get clear. And one is, you know, you know, in the, in the revenue science world, we talk about the cost of the chaos in a business to produce revenue. And it sounds like when you give people uh, a blueprint and you help them with the graphs and visually to understand the trends, you're, you're helping to remove some of the chaos of the organization. And then if that's true, then my follow-on question is, if I'm part of the entrepreneur's team and the data is clearer and there's less chaos, is that uh, kind of trickling down? Because I know everybody's concerned about losing their best staff. And if you make it, uh, less chaotic, and they can understand what they're supposed to be doing. Do you think that's going to have an impact on the ability to keep good people? 
Uh, of course. I mean, uh, it, uh, I think you alluded to in the outline that you sent me about culture in a company and you know how important culture is to, to performance of a company. And um, it, it's, uh, it's always the secret ingredient that people don't get, I think, sometimes. And, and the reason is because it's hard to measure what your culture is, right? But if you, I just want to put this forward. If you have a company that's totally focused on continuous improvement and uh, to the point where the people that work there say when they go home, you know, our, our company's really got their act together. You know, <laughs> I can tell you that a lot of people go home and don't say that. <laughs> you know, a lot of people go home, go home and say, my company is all messed up, you know, and, and uh, I don't know how we make money. I can tell you that. I mean, I've heard it many times from people. So I think part of um, having data, and I'll give you an example in a second, but having data and using it to run the business and um, you know, showing people that you're serious about always thinking about how to do better is an important part of a culture, in, in, you know, a culture that people are proud to be part of. You want your, just, just like to attract employees, you, you want to be known as the best in your industry, I think. I, I, that's what we're trying to be is the best in our industry. In order to be the best in your industry, you have to have your act together operationally. And having your act together operationally means you're looking at data and measuring yourself against a standard. And um, that's not always happening in companies, you know? So, so I gotta tell you a quick story because you and I have, uh, during our CRO thinking, we, I came up with a, um, a product and service that we could offer our clients called the revenue solution. You may remember that. And, and revenue solutions all around the cost of chaos concept that Rick has in his, in his uh, repertoire when he goes through the training. And the cost of chaos is when you're uh, spending money on marketing and sales and you're not really measuring what's, what's working and what's not working. So we have a new client, and I'm, I'm going to go off on a tangent a bit here, but a new client, they're a moving and storage company. And I met with them last week. And I said, Mark, the owner, uh, Mark, I'm looking at the financial statements. You're spending about 15 grand a month on marketing. Tell me about that. Where do you spend your marketing money? He says, well, we have spend money on Google leads and we do, uh, you know, we find out that people sold their house. So we send them a postcard and we do this and that. So he had about five different things that they're doing. And I said, okay, so our, how, which ones of these programs actually bring in the most new leads? And he said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, we should know that, right? <laughs> and I go, yeah, we should know that. So uh, I said, also, you know, once we get a lead, what percent of those leads to convert to customers? Uh, I don't know that. He didn't know that either. And so, but it, instead of making it on the negative thing, he got really excited because like I had brought this really cool idea about how they should do this. So he, he get, gets up and he takes me out into the office. He introduces me to all the people in the company and says, Hey, Jim just came up with this great idea how we're going to, you know, we're going to, I want you to, every time we get somebody calls us up and get wants a quote, I want you to ask them how they heard about the company and we'll start tracking it. I mean, it just, is, it's not a big company. It's a simple little company, but you know, they're spending $15,000 a month on marketing. That's a lot. Yeah. And he has no idea, you know, what's working in the 15, could all the, all the new customers could be coming from the postcard program, which is, cheap as heck or it could be coming from google leads which is expensive and he doesn't really know so yeah. you know i've made myself a a loyal client just with that one question well you know, that's about, such a that's such a great example because if it is the postcards then you can scale it and if you're getting nothing from google then you can save it <laughs> right exactly or you know maybe you still do google but you scale back I and mean, he has no idea I mean, we right. went through this ourselves, to be honest with you. I mean, we're, we're, a, we're, we're the poster boys for how we're supposed to do this, right? But when we did, la I, I always felt that most of our leads came from bankers where they're trying to get a loan uh, approved at, a, at their bank yeah. and the accounting is uh, not very good and, and then the credit committee doesn't approve the loan because they, they don't look at the financials and they don't make sense. And so I always said that to everybody, you know, our, our number one referral partner is bankers. But when we actually did the analysis of where we got our clients from, it was like 10% was from bankers and the rest from all these other places. So I was 
shocked because, <laughs> you know, looking at our own data, which is not, we're not a big company. I think we got 25 referrals or something and only three were from bankers, which is, you know, amazing. And because mentally, you know, I, I, I think you always talk about this, running your business on gut and in, instinct, you know, it doesn't cut it. Mentally, I was thinking, Thinking, you know, instinct-wise, bankers are number one. We got to got to be talking to bankers all the time. But it really was all these other people. So, so I'm going to change direction a little bit. Uh, in your your CFO work, do you do anything with tax planning or other kinds of traditional, uh, you know, accounting services that people may go find separate accountants for? So. Um, no, the bottom the answer is no. However, um, you know, in going through again, another lesson I learned from you is your true north. And, um, you know, our, our true north is, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so I, I'm very um, open or uh, acceptable to adding all kinds of new services to what we do to clients because they all need all these things. And, um, you know, I, I found that if I just stick to my knitting and, and be focused on what we do the best, which is not tax planning or preparation or services, then um, that's better better for us. And it doesn't confuse the client as to what the heck kind of company we are. So we're competing a lot with CPA firms who do taxes and audits and reviews. And, and traditionally, you would think the CPA CPA is the one that's helping the client figure out how to use their financial data to run their business, but they don't ever, I found that very few CPAs actually ever get into that part of the uh, financial analysis or advisory. Um, so what, but what we have decided, since our goal is to help our clients increase their revenue and keep their costs down, we're creating more profit as we go down the road. And the negative to more profit is spending more money on taxes, having to pay more taxes. <laughs> Nobody likes paying taxes. So we've created strategic partners with three different um, service providers, one of which is a tax planning and strategy firm. One is a tax credits firm. So there's all kinds of tax credits that are out there that people don't even know about. And even a traditional CPA typically doesn't know how to, how to get these different credits that are available. So you need a specialist. And then the third is deferred cap. So how can we defer revenue into the future? Yep. And there's, there's consulting firms that help you. You know, when you read about Jeff Bezos didn't pay any taxes or uh, Bill Gates didn't pay any taxes. The reason for that is because they they found a way to defer comp compensation into the future so they don't have to pay current taxes. So we're bringing those same tools to the, to the small business owner so that, you know, he doesn't have to pay the $300,000 uh, checks last last week or a couple of weeks ago was May 17th and the tax returns were due and two two or three days in, in a number of our clients CPAs called up to my clients and said hey you get to write a check for 300 grand 400 grand 500 grand and the client <laughs> had no idea because they hadn't done adequate tax planning and they were not um, informed ahead of time that they were going to have to write these big checks and it caused a lot of problems you know, and that's just, that's just not right. So we, you know, our job with is with, to work with the client and make sure, you know, that we're, as the financial advisor, paying attention to the tax situation and when the taxes are going to be due. We've also found that, you know, a lot of times, you know, not, not to keep knocking the CPAs, but the CPAs do the don't do the taxes correctly. And so um, <clears throat> we've seen where, for example, R&D credits, have been taken that are that are really off the charts and probably are going to be lost at an audit if it's ever audited. And but the client doesn't know that because they're being told by their CPA that this is okay. But you know we've seen how it works with other companies and we can bring that knowledge to bear in in the area of taxation. But we don't you know at this if we started offering taxes it would we start looking more like a CPA firm and you know that's not what we are. So that's why we so far have not gone down that road. So it sounds like, I mean, to me, I, there seems to be great value in when you become intimate with your client's business, not just with their numbers, you can help them identify when they need that specialist that can help them with credits or, you know, some other specialized planning. Because most of us in business, we don't know when to make that call. 
I mean, our goal is to be the trusted advisor of the client and helping them improve the performance of their business. And I always say that there's, and this kind of ties back to you and our relationship, but there's, all, there's three major areas of every business. There's sales and marketing, and that's where you go out and find customers and you attract uh, profitable customers to your company. And, you know, we've had, you know, I'll just stop there and say that we've, we've seen situations where clients are not growing and they're, they, you know, they're stagnant. Uh, they need to, they need to reinvent themselves. And, and you know, we're not sales and marketing specialists, but we can help them by bringing in somebody like you to take them through a process to identify, you know, what they should do different to go to market and be more successful. The second part is operations. So now you've, you've attracted a client and now you have a product to deliver or a service to deliver. And the goal there is to look at efficiency and, and, and quality. So you know, in our case, we want to make sure the quality of our service is such that the client never wants to leave us and go anywhere else. And that, so we need to measure quality and we need to measure um, efficiency and how uh, fast, how quick we are at re responding to customer requests, et cetera, et cetera. So operations is another whole area that, you know, we're not expert in, but there's lots of efficiency experts or um, operations research experts that can come in and help the client improve that part of their business. And then the third part is finance and accounting. And of course, that's where <laughs> it'll be spot on because we're doing it. So you got sales and marketing, operations, finance, and accounting. And it, it's pretty awesome because every company has those three things and it's kind of boils down to that. And there's other things underneath all those, you know, like HR and IT and, um, you know, quality control, but it all falls under those three buckets pretty much. Pretty interesting. You know, I never thought of it until this conversation today, but, you know, if I'm an entrepreneur and whether I'm, uh, I'm going to someday leave the business or the business is going to leave me. And whenever that is, I want it to be as um, high a valuation as possible so that if I'm going to sell it, I'm going to you know, get the full value. And if I'm going to transfer it to my children or my employees, I'm handing them something that they're able to uh, continue on in a very efficient, effective way. So as I'm listening, part of what I'm hearing is the way you're helping with data and uh, um, simplifying the reporting so that it's uh, predictable for the future as opposed to just looking at numbers from the past, you're really helping get a business ready for whatever that transfer will be with succession planning and those kinds of things. Have I got that right? Yeah, and it, what's interesting about that really is um, all those things that you're doing when, if you want to sell your business or you transition it to another generation, you should be doing anyway. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just, a, it's all it is, is best business practices. And, but most companies don't, don't uh, practice best business practices. They don't. And, and it's crazy because whether you're going to sell your business or whether you're going to transition, transition it to another generation, in order for it to be profitable, more profitable and more stable, and, and stable is another major thing. You know, being profitable is one thing, but being stable is important too because you need to be able to withstand a depression or a recession and, and all that. Um, you need to have best business practices. <laughs> you know, and companies like if I was, was talking to a prospect, um, which I was yesterday, for example, and I said. And, you know, you need to do, if you're ever thinking of selling your company, you need to have these things in place. They say, "Well, we're not going to be selling." Well, okay, but you missed the point because, <laughs> irrespective of whether you're, you're going to be selling, maybe I shouldn't even have said it that way. But because, in, in irrespective of that, you need to have your act together. Going back to culture, you know, when when somebody works for a company, I have a client right now that we're getting their act together for them, helping them. And in the past, um, they would have accounts receivable that looked like they needed to be collected. And I would say to the salesperson, hey, Joe, you know, looks like this customer is not paying. And he'd say, I don't, I don't believe that because every time I go there and ask them to pay, they say they already paid the bill and our accounting department just didn't record it correctly. 
okay, well, that's a bad culture. <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're the sales guy and you feel, or a girl, and you feel that um, the accounting department doesn't have its act together, that's not a good thing, you know? And then you, what else is going on in the company that doesn't have its act together? And so yeah. you know, it's important, it's important. And that company was thinking of selling at one point, but now they've certainly got the uh, religion that, you know, having good accounting is, is an important part of running a strong business. And they're, they're our biggest client and, and they spend a lot of money with us every month. And the reason, and they're super happy because they know that at the end of the day that it's helping them make millions, you know, collect their cash way faster than they were before. Their cash flow is way better. Uh, we implemented a program on our accounts receivable in December. It's now May and we've generated about $2 million of cash, extra cash that they uh, had sitting in the accounts receivable before that now they have in their bank. <laughs> and you know, what's what's the value of that? And that's just by doing the best practices and collecting your receivables. Yeah, it's interesting as you uh, tell those stories, I've had the opportunity to interview hundreds of CEOs. And for the group that says, well, I'm never going to sell, I'm going to transfer it to my kids. You know, one of the questions I will ask them is, well, when you transfer it to your kids, uh, do you plan to still have your name on all the loans, you know, because today you guarantee, you know, 90% of everything. And you should see that, well, you have seen the look on their face when they contemplate answering that question. Because the answer is they don't want to be on the notes anymore when their kids take over. You know, they want to take whatever their retirement is and go to Florida or wherever they want to go. And they don't want to worry about the company, but they're not ready for that. I assume that's part of what you guys work on. And, you know, that obviously makes a huge cultural difference. Yes. I mean, just in, in that area, um, the, it, that goes back to the stability part. Of it. So the, the reason that they're ask, the bank is asking for personal guarantees is because when they look at the balance sheet of the company, it's not very stable. You know, they, the, the company, the owners, and this is this is typical, you know, make some money and they take it all out of the company and go buy a boat or a vacation home somewhere, which is fine. You know, that, that's why you own a company to be able to do those things. But, you know, if once you take all the money out and, and your debt to equity ratio isn't very good, the bank is going to say, well, all the money is over here in, in the personal column. And so we want a personal guarantee. So the goal is always to be able to to have the company stand on its own two feet and, and not need a personal guarantee to get a, a line of credit. And, you know, and not, I'm, not, I'm just not saying that all companies can do that because um, you have to balance the needs and wants of the entrepreneur that owns a company versus that, um, you know, what the bank's looking for. But, you know, if, if you ever want to transition it and, you, and you've, got, you've, you've left the company in an unstable situation, you're, you're going to have to personally guarantee it. <laughs> until it gets stable and you know we all know the statistics of what happens when the second generation takes over a business or even the third generation it's typically not pretty uh, and the, the fire and drive that the initial entrepreneur had is not necessarily transitioned to with son and daughter or family members that take over and and it ends up being a uh, you know a, a failure a lot of times there's exceptions so so final question for you, um, what lessons <clears throat> did you take away from the pandemic as it relates to, uh, you know, the outsource fractional CFO concept and to how companies post pandemic need to think differently about organizing uh, for that stability you were just talking about? So I think, you know, every company's story about the COVID is unique, I think, you know, and uh, some companies flourished and other companies had a lot of issues um, happen because of COVID. In our situation, you know, we were started in October of 2019 and COVID hit in March of 2020. So we were only six months old as an organization and not very stable. <laughs> so I go back to my, you know, we were in a very fragile uh, situation. And I think this was pre me doing the program with you. 
But um, we decided when COVID hit, we had a couple of clients call us and say they didn't, they couldn't pay for our services anymore, and they were going to cancel cancel our contract. Um, and um, you know, just a side note, those those companies actually a couple of weeks later called us back up and said their sales took off and they they were hiring us back. <laughs> but at the time that COVID hit in middle of March, we decided we were going to pivot and we were going to start doing PPP loan consulting at a at a flat rate of five thousand dollars a piece. So we signed up all these clients. I think we signed up about ten or fifteen companies to help help them go through the. PPP application process, um, but what we what what happened after that is our our company kept growing irrespective of COVID, and now we are now we were uh, we have limited people at that point to do the work, and now all the people are um, committed to doing these PPP loans, and they don't have time to do our regular business, and so I think you know. Uh, as I said before about me being an entrepreneur and going after opportunities, I if I would have thought of, if I would have thought about what our true north was, doing those short-term projects like that, that's not our true north. We want to have long-term recurring relationships with clients. And guess what? All those people that we did PPP loans, they were came in, did the PPP loan, and never and even talked about wanting us to be involved in their company going forward long term. So it was all just short term revenue. And I don't think we ever even made any money on it because that wasn't our, that not, wasn't our game, you know? So, uh, you know, as after we got through all that and got, you know, let's say into the middle of summer last year, June of, June of 2020, we just kept growing and um, we never looked back. You know, we, back then we had three people. Now we have six people. We probably have doubled the number of clients. So, um, and, we just brought in our second CFO, and uh, I think it all comes back to sticking to your true north and, and not being distracted to go after things that are bright and shiny, but not necessarily <laughs> you know, aligned with what you say your value proposition is to the client. Well, it's, it's interesting as you say that, and I, I'm sure part of the reason you're able to hire good people and keep them is because you are sticking to the true north, and that's what they hired in for. And that's what they want to do. And, you know, when you jettison the, the short-term transactional stuff, they probably all breathe the sigh of relief. Yeah. I mean, just recently, this is a, I'll tell you one quick story. So I, we hired a new person, new controller, and she was getting ready to start work uh, in a couple of weeks. And somebody called me up and said, hey, Jim, um, one of my clients, I think it was a banker, one of my clients, their controller quit, and we need a full-time interim controller uh, to come in and, and work full-time at, at the company, but they have to come to the company headquarters every day in, um, you know, in a certain area. And um, so I, I had this person coming on that I didn't have any work for yet. And I had this opportunity and I'm thinking, hmm. So I called up the woman and I said, you know, hey, um, Joy, we have this opportunity. You know, do you think you'd be interested in doing that? She goes, well, Jim, that's not how you explained to me what you guys do, <laughs> you know, you don't do that kind of work where you put somebody full time somewhere, you know, you do fractional accounting, which means, and so she's teaching me, you know, this is not what you told me the company does. And all of a sudden you're going to stick me on this project just because, you know, from a revenue standpoint, it would have been better or okay because we had to cover her cost right away. But so I called up the, the uh, referral partner and said, no, you know, actually um, it's not, not our way we do things. So that's not our, kind of, uh, that's not our kind of assignment. So, <laughs> so my, so my, my employee was teaching me what I had told, told her that we do, you know, and I was going astray in terms of what I was trying to uh, put together. <laughs> Go after it, revenue. It's amazing how people actually do listen, and that you know the the purpose they signed up for wasn't the one you called her about. One hundred percent. Yep. So, well, Jim, I want to thank you for uh, joining me today. I think this was really uh, insightful for all of us. And anything you want to say here at the end? Um. Well, I'll just say that. Um, you know, accounting is important and um, a lot of different things in your business are, are important, but generating revenue is the, is really the most important because <laughs> without revenue is like the blood in the body, you know, without revenue and especially the right kind of revenue, um, 
where you can be profitable doing certain kinds of, of work and, and being able to attract those clients is, is really important. And a lot of companies um, give short shrift to that and don't really have a defined process of how to go to market and how to generate revenue. And you know, one thing I learned from you, um, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner, so I like, I like learning things all the time. And um, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time, and you you kind of bugged me for a while to you know sign up and do the program. And so last year I did it during COVID when things were a little dicey in the first place. But I've learned so much and apply it every day, um, and almost intrinsically where you don't even think about it. It's just part of how you do things. Um, but you know, the proof's in the pudding. We're we'll probably double well we're, we're at 300 up 300 percent this year over last year but i mean that's because we're a smaller company and it's easier to do but you know my our goal is to grow quickly and become a national company and that all comes from you know the things that you and i talked about and how we how the game plan that we created uh for the cro thinking and in our you know vision for the future for uh blueprint cfo and so i really appreciate that well, I, I love without revenue, you can't hire the people and you can't attract the clients. And, you know, it, that whole thing is so important. Well, and you, you pass revenue on to your clients. And when you pass revenue on to yours, they're happy to pay you for that. Right. Well, you know, a lot of times, you know, I, I bring in the ideas and concepts that you taught me and I, and I'm an amateur at it compared to you, but, um, it, it, it begs a conversation when companies are not growing and, um, you know, or growing very slowly. I, I have a new client that we're starting up this week and I talked to the owner and he said, I said, you know, we, we like to put forward to our clients at least to plan for 20% growth every year <clears throat> because that way you double in, in four years. And he's like, really? And, you know, so he was not thinking that way at all. And I'm thinking, well, why would you hire us to help you if you, if you just want to stay where you are, you know? And so we're, we're pushing those clients to think a little more aggressively because he's, I don't want to say the words fat and happy, but he's kind of fat and happy. He's make, making a good living and he doesn't want to rock the boat. But if you ever want to sell your company, it's another important factor. If it's not growing, you know, if it's growing, you're going to get a, you're going to get a uh, premium over and above what normally you would get because of that growth. And, yep. and growth just means you're, you know, you got your act together <laughs> and you're yep. able to go out and attract clients. You know, there, of course, there's a certain point if you're a family owned business that you don't, and you don't want to become an international company or something, but, you know, that could be at 100 million, 200 million in sales, you know, and, and most companies settle for 10 million and, and stop. So, yeah. well, the combination of continually growing and having documentation as to why and how and the, the, the vector that you're growing on makes your, your multiplier on exit a whole lot better. 100%. Well, Jim, I, I thank you so much for uh, being here today and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you for, for a long time. And uh, I thank everybody else for joining me. us. And... Uh, uh, we will continue our podcast series dedicated to living a revenue culture. And Jim's information is on the screen, so you can contact him anytime you want. And I would highly recommend that uh, if you're looking for uh, growth and a, a real accountant that's going to help you with that, CFO Blueprint Partners is the place to go. Thanks. Thanks, Rick.